Welcome to lesson number 18, which will wrap up our course. In this particular video, we're going to talk about three different techniques, talk therapies, classical conditioning, and systematic desensitization, and get into the nitty gritty of how we can apply them. And at the end of the video, we're going to supply you with a number of different cases that you can utilize to practice and prepare for the final exam. So talk therapies are where we're going to first start off. Now, clearly we are not going to be qualified as talk therapists when we're finished here, but knowing how to help a person to get the most out of talk therapy and knowing how to connect people to talk therapy is very, very important. Understanding what's going on so that in between talk therapy sessions, you can help to be a productive and propelling force for people is also helpful. So even though many clients struggle with abstraction, some people do actually find talk therapies useful. Even though the progress may be slower and the results may be somewhat more limited, that's never a bad thing for people to get talking. We want to have people have lots of brief and frequent exposures in talk therapy as opposed to expecting them to go once a week and sit and talk for an hour at a time. People may work their way up to that, but initially we want to work with therapists who understand the need for shorter and more flexible and adaptive episodes of communication. So brief and frequent exposures are a good way to start. We want to be in the habit with people, not just in the sessions, but in day-to-day -day life, of using words that label and generalize emotions. When people behave a certain way or tell you that they want a certain thing, those are opportunities for us to say to people, what you just described equals feeling lonesome, or what you just described equals sadness. And this becomes particularly important we're helping people to understand the different gradations in emotion. For example, the difference between being annoyed and being furious. Many people will support, don't make those gradations. So when they get upset, they almost always get really upset. And helping people to learn that something should be annoying instead of infuriating is a conversation that we can help have during the week or during everyday interactions that will help that person to be more conversant when they're in a talk therapy. One of the other things we can do is help people to associate their physical reactions with emotions. We called this biofeedback earlier on. When a person is smiling, we might literally need to say, it looks like you're happy right now. Pull out a mirror and have people see what it looks like and feels like at the same time. Similarly, when they're feeling sad or when their cheeks are getting red because they feel embarrassed. Check in frequently with people and reinforce it when they express emotion. Tell them that not only you want to hear what they're feeling, but even when they tell you something that's not easy for you to hear, that they're angry with you, that they don't feel like doing something, really make it clear to people that you're grateful for them and proud of them for expressing that. Use lots of concreteness to validate unspoken expressions of emotion. When somebody crosses their arm and looks down at the floor, tell them how you receive that. Let them know that you are receiving their messages and help them over time to gradually find ways to put that into words if that's possible. And don't worry about trying to shape work and anger while the person is angry. When people are angry, sometimes it's just okay for us to say, I understand that and to simply give them space and time. And when they're calm later on, we can talk about the things that they did that worked and the things that they did that didn't work. We can plan and strategize. We don't want to try and teach while people are at their most emotional. And by the way, this is about anger in this particular bullet point, but it's equally true when people are extremely sad or extremely fearful. We don't want to actually teach that moment. We want to sort of take an emotional snapshot and afterwards be able to say, do you remember when you said this? And do you remember when you did that? How did it work for you? The next tool we want to talk about is classical conditioning. Classical conditioning is particularly useful when we're dealing with people who are afraid. And we mentioned it earlier, but it bears repeating. Classical conditioning is all about the psychological phenomenon of association. It does not require a person to have a high degree of cognitive ability. And different scientists over the course of time have argued that sometimes, in fact, that cognitive ability might get in the way of classical conditioning. It's best when it's combined with the work that I'm about to describe in the next slide, as well as the work we discussed earlier on of using rewards for people doing things and consequences if necessary for doing things that are undesirable or dysfunctional. It's really useful when people are confronting fear or discomfort. It usually causes the person to have a reaction 
that is unconscious to them and it happens at both a physiological level for example their heart rate would be slowed than as opposed to being increased and their blood pressure and breathing rate as well and a psychological response a feeling of being more comfortable and in control some of the rules with classical conditioning are that we always do it in a way that is careful and gradual we don't expect it to happen after one or two of the sessions and it must be done in a way that is very consistent the staff people who put it in place must follow the steps with precision and they must do it with purity as well purity means that we have to understand the basic ideas of classical conditioning if you start messing around with them then it won't work and we have to make this a positive process if we are trying to use aversive therapies such as making people feel uncomfortable in situations where we don't want them to behave a certain way it is not ethical or will, will not be effective instead it's about helping people to feel more comfortable in situations and it's about making it as rewarding and client-centered and dignified as possible so how do we actually do this well the first thing we want to do is identify a stimulus that the person currently really likes such as being in a particular uh, area of their home or liking a particular smell or toy or song then we want to take that thing and strengthen the connection or association between the stimulus and the positive experiences that the person is experiencing for example we want to really make sure that that person gets more and more of that rewarding feeling when they're in that in the presence of that thing so if they're around a person that piece of music we want that piece of music to be playing when they're having the most fun possible if it's in a particular room we want that room to be a place where they're having pleasure or rest and making it as calming and happy as possible then gradually in very very small stages we're going to import the newly conditioned stimulus into the situation where the client is conditioned to have a negative experience so for example if a person is uncomfortable having a bath then that music can start coming with them into the bathroom it has to continue happening in the pleasant circumstance as well we have to refresh that pleasant conditioning all of the time another example of how we might do this is if a person finds it difficult to eat we might start taking the meal into the room where the really pleasant stuff happens but we also have to make sure that that room continues to have lots of other pleasant stuff happening that classical conditioning process will take some time to develop you have to create that connection before you start introducing the associated calming stimulus into the less calm environment don't rush the next thing we want to talk about is called systematic desensitization it's also sometimes referred to as exposure therapy but I prefer this particular terminology because it really describes what it is about it's about a system systematic approach a gradual approach and what's happening is that people are gradually being exposed to something that they find uncomfortable or fearsome and as a result of that they become less and less sensitive to it they get desensitized and that gradual exposure is the incredibly key part it's used to gradually help clients overcome fear most of the time also anxiety but it can even be used for obsessions and compulsions it must not happen suddenly one of the reasons I don't like the term exposure is that if we talk about exposure without clarifying that it has to happen gradually then sometimes people think that they should have all of that exposure happen at once that's called flooding and flooding is a very widely debunked approach that suggests that if you throw the person into the thing they're afraid of and lock them in there they'll get better not only do they not get better but they tend to be traumatized and get far worse in fact many of the fears people have are because they were exposed to something that created fear for them in such an intense way earlier on in their lives so it has to be a very gradual and very systematic exposure to the feared stimulus and or a greater exposure to the subject of whatever it is they're obsessed about so when we do this we do it by having the person take little steps and it can be very helpful for the person to add in some cognitive things if this is possible talking about how they feel and reporting about their physiological sensations and once a person becomes comfortable at a step we might start to add another little step so here are a couple of examples one of them is fictitious the other is real 
Imagine that you had a person who was afraid of heights. You might start to show them pictures of things like ladders or staircases. And you might even, depending on how cute the fear was, start with things that were not visual images, but drawn images, like cartoons of those things. And then gradually, as the person began to report that they found that easy to do, start moving into pictures that were a little bit more vivid, or even videos of steps. We might go someplace where there are steps or ladders and see if we could get close to those things. And after a while, we might take one step up a step and practice feeling okay with that, maybe sitting on this step. And you can see where this goes. Over a period of many exposures, we would gradually work our way up those steps. Well, as we did this, we want to make sure we're giving that person rewards and praise that we're taking note of their physiological symptoms. And we can bring in that classical conditioning stimulus if it's available to us as well. I said I would give you another example. Well, I'll give you the example of a person we worked with who was afraid of dogs. So we started to go and look at books about dogs. After a while, the books went from being books about cartoon images to dog pictures. Then we started walking past the pet store. And usually, of course, there were puppies in the window and puppies were not very intimidating. After a while, we were able to go into the pet store. After a while, we were able to touch the puppies. After a while, we were able to touch larger but fully, sorry, small but fully grown dogs, like little poodles and so forth. And the person eventually got to the point where they could actually have a staff person bring a dog into the workplace. Now, they never got to the point where they were walking dogs, and we didn't really care about that. We only cared about their exposure to dogs because it created some problem in their life. And in the case of this particular individual, the problem that it caused was that they would often see a dog and run without looking into the middle of the road. So we didn't want to shape their behavior to a point that was good for us. We only needed to shape it to a point that it was good for them. They didn't need to become a dog lover. They just needed to get to a point where they were safe. So don't forget that it has to be a positive, supportive experience. And again, staff have to be highly consistent in how they do it. If somebody rushes or if somebody starts making this about somebody getting scolded or shamed for being afraid, it won't work. And remember that you can combine it with the techniques we've talked about earlier. So how is it done? I've already spent some of the time on this. First, begin at an exposure level where the person is already comfortable. Looking at pictures of dogs or pictures of ladders was easy for the person, but we still started there until the person was really, really finding that they were comfortable. And then start to give the person rewards for willingness to be exposed, to actually go through this process. Support the person emotionally. Have that person check in with you and tell you how they're feeling. And have conversations about whether the person is safe and checking in with the reality rationally of the experience. Ask the person if they notice that about themselves. Encourage them to be metacommunicative within themselves and metacognitive. Continuously monitor the client's emotional state so that you don't expose the person too quickly, causing them to feel traumatized. Expose the person very gradually to the exposures over many brief occasions. Tracking as you go, making sure that your data is showing that it's not too fast or too slow, and it's better to be slow if necessary. Give lots of reinforcement during the actual episodes, and again, after you're done, reward the person for their effort and for being willing to do this. And to improve the success of the therapy, you might want to have that person do some things that encourage thought, like journaling or debriefing. You might want to celebrate milestones, literally having little parties or celebrations. And you can help people mentally prepare in advance by using other tools we've talked about, such as social stories or having a schedule in the room that shows that their sessions are coming up. And remember again that you can combine this with that classically conditioned calming stimulus. All right. Well, that wraps us up, except that I'm going to give you a few examples and you can pause the video and use them to practice your skills so that you're in good shape for the assessment portions of the course. Here are a few of them. Roger won't get out of the car until you take him home. You've gone someplace, he refuses to get out of the car, and he expects you to take him home. Eli refuses to come for supper. Dana yells at waiters if they don't take her order first. Booth shares the intimate details of his sex life with strangers. Ranjit is screaming she's going to kill you. Carmen cries at the sight of bearded men. Bill pushes strangers if they stand too close to him. 
Reagan pours everyone's coffee down the drain when they aren't watching. Petra tries to pinch the rear ends of men wearing uniforms or shorts. And Sheila pretends she wants a hug from staff, but pulls their hair when she gets close. Remember as you're working on this stuff, to think about things from as many different categories from this course as we possibly can. That's an important comprehensive or part of that comprehensiveness. And expect that this will take practice and try working in teams. Often other people will be able to scaffold off your ideas and you can completely come, can come up with a more complete set of responses because of that. All right, that's a long set of videos and I appreciate you paying attention as you went along here. Hopefully this has helped tie together many of the things we've studied in our course and gives you a set of tools that you can imagine actually applying in the workplace. All right, thanks for taking it along and uh, don't be afraid to ask any questions if anything we've covered remains unclear.